Ryan. He's come to Santander College. And our key topic for today's chat will be about athletic development for team sport athletes. So parents of young athletes, athletes themselves, and of course, high performance staff, staff, make sure to stick around. If you've got any questions for us, you can hit us up on the uh, comment section below wherever you listen to this live chat show. And welcome, Des. Really looking forward to having this chat, mate. Thanks for jumping on. For the time, it's important to it's more complex play academy work, lots of players, parents, stages of development. It's it's much more interesting than that high performance stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um yeah, like you said, it's there's plenty plenty um, going on when you're managing a large group like that and and is it something that you've always been passionate about des like obviously we'll get into the topic a little bit later on but just to, it's something it seems like you're pretty excited about uh, straight off the bat it, it grew i suppose is how i describe it uh, and my first role was in an academy uh back in 1998 and what happened next is it was in connacht rugby yeah academies and youth development then far too early in my career, I got a promotion to the adult professional team. Uh, I wasn't ready for it. I, I had a lot to learn very quickly. Thankfully, I was looked after with, with mentors like Liam Hennessy and so on. And um, yeah, got to grips with that. Uh, challenging. Uh, lucky to work with the Irish national team in rugby. But genuinely, about six, eight years into it, I was going, okay, this is a bit repetitive, home match, away match, gym, recovery, team training. Uh, other people all oh, love it and excited by the big game on the weekend. And I, I was, but that did fade. And then I said to my boss, I was honest with him in a, in a review, is there something else I could focus on? And he said academy. And I said, yeah, cool, let's do that. But he said, Dej, you know nothing about it. And I had to study for a year. He gave me a lot of things to study. And then he gave me the opportunity in Academy. And I loved it. And it was so varied, so much rich learning, so much support was needed, so much variation. And yeah, from, from then on in the Irish Rugby Academies, um, helping that, leading people in that, then on to Arsenal Academy, where you could help develop younger players under nine all the way up. That was yeah, well. fascinating. Um, so yeah, my my interest in it grew um, early in my career for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you mentioned uh, Liam. Um, have there been some other strong influences or mentors, if you like, that have helped you along yeah. the way or helped shape yeah. your philosophy? Definitely. And and I, I was just thinking about that, Liam. Yeah, from sports science, strength and conditioning. But most of the other mentors are from coaching. Um, People like Stephen Abood, now people might know him, but a genius. Um, he was the technical director in uh, Irish rugby. He did some fantastic work there, pulling people together, uh, bringing Irish rugby from where it was pretty useless in the 90s. And we lost almost every match to yeah one of the best teams in the world now, one of the best unions in the world. And he, he had a lot to do with that. So... Um, he went to Italy rugby after that and he helped improve the younger teams there and he's off to Canada rugby next so I always check in with him he is a great man for for challenging me for asking me good tough questions not giving too many answers but taking me on a journey um, in the answers um, and people like John Tobin another coach in Gaelic games uh, Per Metasacker the academy manager in Arsenal Brilliant at, at creating a vision, mission, pillars, values, again, pulling people together. Uh, really enjoyed his his leadership there. And Steve Morrow, um, scout, talent developer, ex-player, coach. Uh, yeah, he really helped me integrate into soccer, as I call it, because football obviously is Gaelic games football. And <laughs> yeah, he helped me in the transition to soccer from rugby. Uh, so yeah, enjoyable people to to meet and, and develop. Yeah, great range of different people there and and the backgrounds. Uh, what about some highlights, Des? Some moments of your career that sort of spring front of mind that you're proud of? 
Yeah, yeah. The as as an academy coach is, is what I describe myself. So our best highlights are sitting in the stand with everybody else watching the game, and our trophies are when those young people, well, they'll be adults then, hop onto the pitch for the first time, their first cap, um, playing regularly with the adult team. That's the success in academy. So, so like helping young players in academies in Irish rugby from 07 to 12, you have to wait, you have to be patient. And when I go to the Six Nations around 2018 and the win a Grand Slam and there's plenty of players that came through the, the system, that's the highlights. Arsenal currently, they're, they're second. They didn't win the league. But plenty of good, young, talented men from the academies uh, with the team and other players sitting back and watching them across Europe uh, with other teams. So basically seeing those people develop um, are the highlights um, for sure. And a highlight, and I'm mainly sharing it because people might be interested, is I, I helped author two papers. So in terms of the approach we used for physically developing players in Arsenal, um, we published that in the NSCA journal bit of an egotistical title, Developing World Class Players, but anyway, uh, someone else came up with that. And um, recently, we we published an action statement for Gaelic Games Athletic Development in the UKCA Journal. And a lot of people on that, I think 14 authors on that, pointing out the, the, the future of athletic development in Gaelic Games, the approach, what's best practice. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm very happy with those papers that they're published, real practical, practical papers from the real world. Yeah, that's fantastic. We'll have to add links to them in the show notes for those listening in so you can easily access them. But um, what about on the flip side, obviously with elite sport comes pressure. What have been some moments over your career that uh, have been challenging and uh, how did you sort of learn or grow from those situations? Yeah, definitely. And over the, I was in Arsenal Academy for nine years, different coaches come and go. Different coaches have different philosophies. Um, and in in soccer, sometimes athletic development, strength training, strength conditioning is looked on with caution. Um, oh, will it slow them down? Is it the right thing? Will it affect their skills? Will they become too big? And yeah, uh, one of the challenges, I, I was working closely with uh, an academy manager, Andrew Shanker, very good, very experienced. Um, comes from Holland, so his background would be, I suppose, uh, uh, more Raymond Verhagen type philosophy to physically developing, um, and and yeah, working with him, I had to come up with solutions. So the learnings was right, is talk to him, listen to him. What is his background? What is his understanding? Uh, his perception of physical development. Go. Once you know that, and I, I listened, and then I went, okay, I want to study that. I went and studied it. I went and did the courses, bought the books that, that would be his background. Then I got the language, and I used that language when I was talking to him. And then I spoke with him about athletic development in Arsenal, traditional um, athletic development, why it's okay to do strength training at a young age. And he was open and accepted of it. And then it became more of a collaboration. But it could have been a tension. It could have been two different philosophies very far away from each other, disagreeing with each other. And the key learning was, yeah, let's study the other person's philosophy. And when they saw I was had an interest in it, I went to the trouble of going abroad and even studying the course, that opened the door and it, it landed in a good place. Uh, another challenge more back in time in Irish rugby, if you're working for a national government body, people's perception of uh, strength training and young people. Oh, you shouldn't do it, stunt their growth, all those myths, the usual things. So so changing people's perception of that, understanding of that, education of that, and, and changing the whole community. Um, yeah, that was, that was challenging. But the solution is simplifying, educating, right. workshopping, mm -hmm. talking with, uh, doing a roadshow around the provinces of what is youth athletic development, what it isn't, uh, sharing the research in a simple way, and then and being patient. It takes time, 
yeah, they were two challenges, but two good experiences. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Great problem solving and um, awesome for the listeners, especially strength coaches, to hear sort of what's practical and, and how you sort of have to think to, to find a way. And like you said, it might not happen, um, you know, quickly, but if you persist at it, uh, things will turn. So thank you for sharing that. Some couple of great stories. Um, feel free to keep, keep bringing plenty more. They're, they're um, great, to, great to learn. We'll, we'll get into the key topic of choice, man. As you mentioned, athlete development is a passion of yours. What are some key principles, uh, philosophies, if you like, um, to yeah, an athlete development for team sport athletes? Yeah, for sure. And, and the first thing is to, to have a philosophy. And it's one of the the first questions I ask when we have interviews in the various organizations I work with, I'm, I'm interested in the person's philosophy. And then really an organization should have a philosophy or an approach, many different names for it. Like, like for example, uh, in Arsenal Academy, uh, and we published it, it's the Arrow approach. So first of all, we had to listen and understand the, the football philosophy. And there's a strong one there in the club, originated through Arsene Wenger, lived by people that worked with him. And it's they, they basically want highly technical players composed on the ball, ability to, to have do exciting combination play, high speed players, high speed repeatability players. So once you learn what the technical sport philosophy is, then you can create the the athletic development philosophy. So the athletic development philosophy in, in Arsenal is the arrow approach. Also listening to the to the CEO at the time, uh, they wanted players ready quickly and appropriately. So the arrow was to point that way. Let's get them ready quickly and efficiently. And then built into the arrow, and a lot of people created this, is functional competence. So these young people, they got to have move well good mobility, good stability, being able to get into a, a lot of different positions with control. Uh, movement skills was the next pillar in the, ar in the arrow. So having mature level movement skills and then going on to more advanced uh, speed plyo type activities. Integrated conditioning was another part of the, the arrow. So getting fit through the game in the majority because it's a highly technical club. And then planning and periodization, making sure the players don't do too much or too little. Um, and one of the aims there was to reduce the risk of injury and reduce injuries within the academy. So if you listen to the coaches, if you listen to the decision makers in the club, if you see the needs of the players, then an approach, a philosophy appears like the arrow. And then everybody should understand it, even parents, players, coaches, facilities, uh, operations, science and medicine. Now you've got a, an approach built on the needs of the players, the needs of the club and and everything else grows from there the specifics of of the the athletic development how for a um perhaps a uh an s and c that's listening that uh, and their workplace doesn't have something that clear um but they'd like to sort of bring that to the table and workshop that concept of bringing their in their own um mm -hmm. arrow if you like how long did it take uh to to create that philosophy and then also um how hard was it to sort of maintain the standards uh, from a consistency point of view where you kept sticking to it before it became yeah. a habit? Good, good question. Because the short answer is it took one hour and the longer answer, it took nine years because it's it reviewed, happened. it evolves, yeah. it's added to. And everybody should do it. And I think they'll enjoy it. And a lot of people are doing it now. We're not the only ones. Um, but get people in a room, right? Ask the question. What sort of players do we want to develop? Now, how are we going to develop them? And I can remember the meeting where it appeared and the doctor came up with the arrow once we described what the CEO, Ivan Gazidis, wanted. He wanted players ready quickly and efficiently. Okay, let's listen and let's draw that up. Then the four pillars of it appeared from people there. Coaches were in the room, so technically they were there at the creation of this. Um, they had an input to this. Now you've got buy-in. And at the end of that hour, you, you've only a little drawn. Now it's not much, but now we can go and fill out the, the the next few pages. And at the end of the first season, it might only been ten pages long. After that, came 
okay, what's our, our, our progression going to be? And our progression was how well, not how much, level one player. Then how well and how much, get them strong, level two player. Then how well, how much, how fast, level three player. And then elite level, which is level four, getting ready for the adult first team or being better than the players in the adult first team. Then came the, 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 what the players have to achieve to get from one level to another. Now you've got some challenges for the players in, in technique, in movement, in loads lifted, etc. as you go through this. And then, okay, let's create an exercise menu. Boom, exercise menu appears in the categories of horizontal, push-pull, vertical push-pull, single, double, uh, um, pillar strength, jumps, etc. And now you've exercise menu. And then framework for each stage of development. Okay, with the young players, we'd like to do fundamental movement skills, primal movements, cooperative games, purposeful play. Now we have a framework for the sessions with the young players. Now we fill out the menu and you can see how it can, can grow over the nine years then. And at the end of every year, let's review, let's reflect. Oh yeah, this second year, there's a bit of a challenge in, in specialization. What should they do? What they shouldn't do in terms of sport? Let's create a, a position statement on specialization. Okay, now that appears, that goes into the, the approach. Um, and then we had some challenges with surfaces. Okay, what boots should the players wear? Let's do a little position statement on that. And let's add that to the document. And another year, uh, I'll stop now in a minute, don't worry. We had a, it was a big learning for me. Yeah, Ramadan, one of the players, I, I'm quite embarrassed. Uh, it was it was new to me. I never trained uh, a player during Ramadan. I learned so much from the player. Uh, we didn't handle it well the first year. He actually put on fat mass. I never thought that would have happened, considering the, the context of Ramadan. And basically just sat down, listened to him, sat down, listened to, to other people. And we came up with our approach to Ramadan. Um, and guidelines for it from then. And that goes into the athletic development framework. Now you've got a, a large working document that, by the way, is only one section of the overall performance plan. And, and the club would have a vision, mission, objective, strategies, key performance indicators, values. And in, in, in Arsenal Academy, there'll be four pillars of player development. And it, like technical, tactical, psychosocial, physical and we'd fit into the the physical and all this document athletic development framework would be the the guidance on how the players are physically developed but there'll be something similar for technical for education for psychosocial um and now you're talking about a real high quality long-term player development framework um within a club or an academy or or a national government body with that level of detail but it starts with a 45 minute meeting and can take as long as it goes on for yeah it's great that it's sort of not just that 45 meeting and then it's sort of forgotten about and not actioned but mm. it's constantly refined and polished up over the years um and reviewed like you said it's so important and um, for that that workbook that you mentioned with the position statements is that something that's for like a new staff member to come in and, and part of their onboarding process or is it for players to access new players like talk us through who so it has access yeah. to that workbook you're right that would be mainly the science and medicine department and uh, mm -hmm. the full detail we're probably the only ones interested in the full detail but access of course coaches have a can have a look at it uh, they contribute to certain parts of it the integrated conditioning um, players, yeah, it, it, that would be more the education workshops that are built into the journey of the player. And the content would be simplified, broken down into different workshops and then delivered to the player. Um, similarly with parent workshops. Similarly, in, in my old office, I had a, a poster behind me which summarized the, the framework. So it would be shared appropriately so that it's it's digestible, understandable, and and memorable, in terms of players, parents, other support people, um, but yeah, uh, freely available to people within the club, and yeah, accessible. And you mentioned the um, you know listening to the technical coaches, 
and the operatives and 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 how important it was for for players to be fast and repeat at repeat speed mm -hmm. um so taking that information into account did that mean that we're going to add in an extra speed session in once a fortnight or we're going to prioritize speed at the start of sessions like how, how did just sort of action in that philosophy yeah. i guess so a, a very important thing to me is making sure we've windows to develop players and I've been in many different organizations and at different stages of the season, when pressure comes on, coaches might go, oh, no, no, we won't do speed today. No, no, we won't do, I need to work on, on technical, etc." And there'll always will be that bit of give and take. But in a large organization where there's teams from under nine to under 23, 220 odd players, many different coaches, many different support people, one of the important things is to agree with le senior leadership where we are the windows that we physically develop the player with just the, the athletic development coach or with the athletic development coach and the technical coach so that was one of the things that i was i was very happy with because it takes consistent contact and application over long term to develop players and you need the windows to do that so for example under 18s who are full-time in, in a soccer club like, like Arsenal, they would come in on Monday and do monitoring, readiness to train. They do readiness to train on Friday as well. There's a bit of a story to that, actually. The first year I brought the players together and I said, how often would you be willing to do readiness to train? And I explained what it was. But I really want you to tell me the truth. And I really want you to do the assessments with full intensity. And otherwise, it is not worth doing it. And I said, how often would you be willing to do that? And they went, mm, twice a week. And in my head, I was going, oh, no, I want to do it most days, maybe four times. OK. And I said, right, I would rather do it more, but we'll do what you said, as long as you do it intensely and you tell the truth. So they did. And as time went by, I went, you know, they were right and I was wrong. Because all I needed is a little glimpse how the players are at the start of the week and a little yeah. glimpse at the end of the week. Did we do a developmental week? Did we do too much, too little? If there was uh, players flagged on Monday, of course, you could do a few more during the week with that individual in those areas. But I sat back and I went, players can be very clever at times. And they were bang on with the amount. And if we did it more times than that, they wouldn't do it properly. They'd just fill out the palms just with random numbers they wouldn't jump as properly as they should so sorry i'm digressing but that was an important um insight from the players so monitoring on monday and uh, then what we call a priority session so before they go out to the pitch whatever they need to improve on and it could be a young player from from spain who hasn't a high strength and condition age just joined us needs to learn his techniques it could be another player who didn't um um, hasn't got good movement quality based on the movement screens and observations, needs to work on their mobility stability. Another player needs to work on their speed if it's the appropriate time of the week, probably not on Monday, but they're maybe working on speed te technique. Other players need to work on speed strength, strength speed, um, etc. So, and then just getting active activated for the session. So a priority session next 20 minutes. I'm, I'm over exaggerating the 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 intensity and, and volume of it, but it's just a, a 20 minute unit before they go to the pitch. Then pitch training, typically in the morning on a Monday, lunch and athletic development in the afternoon, mainly upper body, but, but somewhat whole body. Uh, Tuesday, priority session, double pitch session, another gym session at the end of the day, blasting their legs, the explosive exercises in the gym done earlier in the morning in the priority session. Usually it'd be Wednesday off for cover after that tough Tuesday. Then in for Thursday, priority session, pitch session, afternoon gym session, athletic development, Friday, monitoring. Okay, did we could do a good developmental week? Um, then pitch session and uh, yeah, a, a half day Friday, uh, education maybe in the afternoon, education on the Wednesday, match on the the uh, Saturday. So before the trainings on Tuesday, we got more linear game speed and we got more change of direction game speed on the Thursday. Then uh, athletic development on the Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning after and afternoon, Thursday afternoon. And priority sessions four times 
in the week in the morning and two monitoring. So that's loads of time to get athletic development. And really the the Tuesday morning session is the real tough football fitness session where we, we yeah, get them fit. And with the, the Yeah, yeah. Well, I, with the development program, it, it's uh, a lot more uh, advanced than it is in Australia in terms of how we prepare professionals. Uh, typically, there'll be high school athletes and they've um, that they might be in some talent pathway programs from a part-time basis and then they're drafted and now they're a full-time athlete where there's a real focus from nearly mm -hmm. on, like you mentioned, from a nine-year-old all the way through to hopefully they make pro. Uh, I imagine you've seen a lot of different academy programs. Uh, what are some of the uh, real perks when you do develop an athlete from such a younger age from a physical athlete development point of view? Oh, yeah. You, um, you can't go wrong investing in young people. And I've just seen it work too many times. Like the example of Irish rugby in the, as I said, in the nineties, not good down at the bottom of the five nations as it was then six nations. Um, then academies were in place. Long-term player development pathway was introduced. Uh, training age grew. Education in the schools happened. Collaboration with the schools regular access to the players, more intense access at the older academy age. And then you've got these players coming through, like like Johnny Sexton, like Sean O'Brien. Then the, the next generation come through and the next generation, and it just flows. And similarly with, with Arsenal, um, the club knew that it, it needed to improve in the area in terms of science and medicine. Clever people like Colin Lewin wanted to bring people like myself and others in. Uh, they knew it's challenging jump from teenage years into something like the Premier League. They knew it's challenging to jump from school by soccer to full-time academy soccer. They, they need support players. But I think if we sit back and the club is, is very appreciative of, of the players that came through the system, uh, you've got players like Bakayo Saka, Neil Smith-Rowe, Eddie Nketiah, Joe Willock, who went to Newcastle for millions and millions. So now it's, it's self-funds and it creates players and it, it's a more economical way of doing things than spending hundreds of millions on a, on a player uh, when you can develop your own player. But I will say it's a specialist area. Um, it's, it needs a bit of grey hair, a bit of experience. When you're we are developing something too often it's early career mid-career practitioners yeah. that are put into academy how are they in meetings how are they at influencing how are they at um getting budgets how are they at budgeting how are they at managing people their early career mid-career logic would suggest that they're they're just learning but mm. as i said earlier it's way more complex parents uh, different stages of development different levels of knowledge you need to know all the the, the papers, research models on, on player development, like Rodri Lloyd's work, uh, the Goblin model that's, that's from Australia, um, Dan Baker's work, uh, Avery Fagenbaum's work, uh, Sean Cummings' work, so important. And you've got to have a, a great understanding of maturation, biological maturation. How do you assess that? How do you interpret it? How do you share it? What do you do once you have the information? You've figured out this player is an early developer, this player is a, a late developer. This player is growing 18 centimetres a year at this moment in time. How do you modify training based on that? Should you modify training? And um, how do you articulate that to the coaches, parents, to make sure the right players stay in the system or are in the system? And be humble that this is only the physical information. It's only mm -hmm. one slice of the cake. It's only maturation in terms of, of physical there's there's a psychological maturation. There's technical tactical maturation. You've to get people together to look at the full picture, to evaluate the player, to develop the program, and to select or deselect if it's that stage. So very responsible, very complex. The right people, and the more experienced people in academies, the more worthwhile. Um, I would say, mm. but so beneficial. You can't go wrong with investing in in young people. Um, yeah. And is, have you noticed over the last sort of 10, 15 years that the big clubs, I imagine, Jay, to have people like yourself, you know, people that have got experience comes 
you know, some financial investment from the club, uh, hence why in the other clubs it will be new grads because it, they'll take the, 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 you know, the smaller wage. Um, mm. And that's traditionally how it's probably done more often than not in academy programs. People get to cut their teeth, um, but it's to detriment, obviously, to, to younger elite athletes. Uh, so how do you how do you sort of see the progress over the last sort of 10 years? Is it quite exponential in terms of clubs are really starting to see the value like you said, the investment they can get uh, on the other end of it with, with big-time players, um, and therefore is it changing or has it sort of been something that's been slow progress from your point of view? I, uh, I, I see a change, definitely, and more more needs to happen. And But, yeah, it is changing. And I see it in the Premier League. There's, there's other big clubs with uh, very experienced people um in academy head of science and medicine type positions i see the same trend in the female game uh in the adult female sports like previously it used to be again early mid-career people using it as a stepping stone now clubs in in england are putting very experienced people into those positions and rightly so because they're they're hundred cap international players that need good knowledge supporting them um, but yeah, it's it's evolving that way, slowly. Uh, once people see the benefits, they awaken to it, and more and more people are awakening to it. And and I'll emphasise, you do need the experience again. And a story linked with that would be when I arrived in Arsenal. Like a lot of soccer um, clubs, the young players came along, had their breakfast, did their training, did a few exercises after training or before. Uh, had their lunch and went home and now in my lens I'm going oh no these are young they need to be here all day full day nine to five they've loads of work to do in all many areas but someone with less experience might have went oh no this is rubbish no you need to change to this that doesn't achieve change what I did is chat through with the, the senior decision makers chat through with facilities everyone that would affect the restaurant chat through with, with the kid people, chat through with the coaches, um, discuss it in a journey, lay out options, learn some some good suggestions, and then everyone decides, yeah, we do need to train nine to five most days. How can we do it? Well, if we put this in place, we might need a bit more investment here. Yeah, let's go get that. Will this put people out in any way? Maybe at the start, but everyone sees the logic to it, and then it happens. And, and that's the type of evolution, influence that a, a more experienced person can have to get the, the best out of environments like academies. Um, but yeah, yeah, I see it growing. And obviously, sporting organisations have the priorities like their main team or whatever it may be. But for sustainability, for, for regular throughput of players, it's, it's worth the investment Yeah, in the academy. Um, some some things confuse it out there in 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 the academic world. People would say success at younger age groups does not predict success at older age groups. Technically, in certain populations, that's true. But what I my lens looking at that is, mm, yeah, but probably not the correct players were selected at the young age. Maturation mm. wasn't taken into consideration, and um, holistic development wasn't in place. To help the right talent id wasn't in place etc so yep. there are some communities that would say it's not worth investing in it because you don't know who the stars are going to be mm. but in in other more evolved environments yeah it's, it's hard to predict who's going to be the talented people but within a, a range of a squad yeah you're going to be looking after some very talented people there um, yeah. and you're you're less likely to miss out and very hard for a player to play in the top five leagues in Europe in soccer if they're not well developed from a young age. So yeah, it's, it's so a necessity, exactly. really. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned the importance of uh, integrating uh, and you've, throughout the whole time that a holistic program, how essential it is, not just looking at a lens of the physical, but the tactical, the te technical, the psychological. So that component of getting the fitness work in with, you know, ball in hand or ball in foot uh, and with the coaches. Is, is that a matter of, um, how, like, for the athletes that perhaps need to work on their aerobic capacity and need that foundational 
aerobic development? Is it using objective markers like GPS to give them feedback to improve the, with with the soccer drills, or do you sort of just top them up with the work? Oh, it's, Perhaps it's, if they're they're not doing the work yeah. in the skills, so you top them up after. How do you sort of approach that? Love, lovely area, and from top down, one of the pillars of player development is called in Arsenal is most efficient mover, and a subhead heading of that is football fitness. And a very clever strategy of the academy manager, Per Matisaker, is to highlight the all in football, in red. And the message there is all of us are responsible, not just the coach, not just the fitness coach. You know how it is if a team isn't fit, oh, that fitness coach isn't good enough or what strength conditioner or whatever. He emphasized yeah. we're all responsible for it. nutrition, psychology, operations. So we all need to get that player to be a most efficient mover in the the pillar there so now you move down it's people working together okay mm -hmm. you got a coach conditioner we do our tests we do our our, our mass tests we do our yo-yo intermittent recovery level one we know what we've nine years of data we know what the players level should be at we know who needs to work on something who doesn't then but we we're thinking of the philosophy of the club we like to get fit through the game in the majority yeah you know, technical players it's more efficient if it's done through the game, more beneficial in many other ways. Right, now you've got the coach and conditioner planning together. Where's the big day? It's the football fitness day on the Tuesday. Thursday, yeah, that's tasty enough session. That's planned together as well. Um, restart day and match day minus one, yeah, mainly the coach. Conditioner interested in the volume and intensity. Now you uh, in the environment like Arsenal Academy, you got GPS. Okay, let's... Do our session design with our acute training variables, the size of the pitch, duration of the, of the games, the, the the duration of the session, the content of the session. Is it possession games at the start? Is it um, small-sided games in the middle or the end? And yeah, now you've got uh, your session plan. If you do that every week, now you've got a, a, a curriculum of sessions. Mm -hmm. And if you assess every session, now you've got the typical outputs for each of those sessions and your menu grows but back to the session the gold standard is live gps session plan together aiming for certain outputs like 800 meters of high speed running on a tuesday before a saturday game uh true games in the majority conditioners there letting the coach know how it's going we're going good coach coach is interested session finishes coach is happy with the technical tactical the effort of the players and the right outputs are achieved. It might be a rainy Tuesday. Players may be a bit grumpy. You mightn't achieve that. Coaches, happy. Yeah, let's top them up. Let's get what we were trying to get to make sure it's a worthwhile session. And then that's where the top up comes in. Now, maybe on a Tuesday as well, you need the speed stimulus at the start when you're fresh. GPS is there. Conditioner creates the environment for a, a maximum sprint. Yes, players have got above 95% of their max speed. They've got their speed stimulus. They've got their conditioning through the game. If they didn't get what we were aiming for, they're topped up. Uh, that's a, a wonderful environment, enjoyable um, environment to develop the player's fitness. It's turning the pitch into a gym session. You have your yeah. sets, reps, loads. Happy. Gradual, yeah, gradual overload. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of the areas of athletic development I, I really enjoy. And then in, the, in an academy, you're sharing information. This is under 16s, this is under 18s, this is under 23. It should be a stairway. Maybe at times it isn't. It, it, it is hard to find a coach that's good at that, what I just described. Mm. Um, the top coaches are, some coaches struggle with it. They're, um, and they need to be helped. And yeah, so there's, there's variations of it out there. But what yeah. you can do, if a coach is struggling, you can share, oh, look at what the players are doing before. We probably need to progress from that because they're doing something similar under 16s, under 18s, for example. Look at where the players have to get to under 23s. There's a big step. Let's close that gap. Look at what they're doing at the adult team and suggestions can be made. And there's nothing wrong with, okay, if we have to do it mainly through top-ups and let's practice with these games. Let's workshop it with other coaches who are very good at it. Let's share the activities that create those big outputs. And, and it grows. It grows from there. And you mentioned another one in terms of player availability and how that was highly valued. 
what what are some important injury mitigation sort of practices that the clubs you know or you've yeah. seen effective yeah. clubs have done over the years so the readiness to train uh, was there as i said on the the monday and the the friday for the older players and that was simple things like groin squeeze counter movement jump knee to wall weight palms hydration and what we tried to do is over the course of a season in the squad of about 40 50 between two age groups let's aim for just eight to ten times we pull a player from training because if we're pulling players from training more than that we're not planning well so sometimes we achieved that sometimes we didn't it was more um but if we plan things properly yeah only through the whole season we pull a player from training eight to ten times now every week there'd be three to four players where training would be modified and they may not do all the conditioning games they may not do all of the session in full and that helps the player get back to full recovery get ready for the developmental sessions and the match on the weekend so there's the monitoring and the way it flowed was the players come in do their monitoring uh, go up for breakfast coaches look at the information then the most important thing they go up and they have chats with the player get the context just let him have his input then there's time to go to the planning session with the coaches modifications could be made or a player doesn't train or can't train um and then it flows into the into the session so that's one thing another very interesting area in academy is again the maturation so if we assess the player's uh, biological maturation using the camus roach method percentage of adult height we have a couple of measurements we know the rate of growth of a player there's the context a player is growing more than 7.2 centimeters a year research would suggest the player is more predisposed to growth related injuries but we don't change anything just based on that one figure we sit in an interdisciplinary team okay anything from the physio yeah the player is two out of ten pain in their knee so as goods but not injured can train okay context conditioner yeah uh, coordination in the gym not good recently adolescent awkwardness okay two symptoms coach yeah i know it's the same on the pitch coordination it's not great uh right the coach is the CEO of the team it's your call coach but one thing we could do to mitigate injury is we don't do the last 15 minutes of the session the player does coordination work with the physio conditioner and um, that reduces the chance of that two out of ten going up to eight out of ten and then the player not training and we manage the player through that phase of growth and the, the coach agrees okay there's a good uh, way of keeping the player on the pitch um, keeping good quality injury audits and reviewing every quarter and coming up with actions and if you don't have a have a good phase okay well let's look at the possible contributors let's write down the the things we should change and let's look at that again this time next year to reduce the risk of injury um yeah helps and and i'm a big believer in good quality movement uh, functional competence doing good quality screens, hip internal, internal, external rotation, overhead squats, modified Thomas tests, uh, more dynamic ones like, like tuck tests, less tests. Once you have that info and your own observations, okay, there's a, a baseline for a player. Now, obviously, movement scores don't predict injuries. Not, not many things do, but it gives you a clue. It's a contributor to reducing the risk. So if those scores get worse, through fatigue through um, whatever it may be okay let's check them again let's get back to normal an academy player will be trying to develop them anyway and that helps reduce the the risk of injury um, along with of course getting strong that's fantastic and that helps so much yeah yeah thank you for sharing that that's a great um great way to just get an insight on the decision making and how you really apply the information if you had that same scenario but with a senior athlete two out of ten pain and notice a bit of training coordination was off but um they've got an upcoming game would you you know let them carry on or or, or is it a similar thing for you know um for a I'm, mature I'm, age athlete i'm stepping out of my comfort zone now you mentioned adult players but i did, did yeah. work with adult players in the past and the difference is hey it's under 18s 
it's not the World Cup. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where it is more challenging with the adults. Um, you can modify training. You can do more squad rotation. You can just sit the player out uh, if there's a, a risk there. Oh, different world if you're trying to win the Heineken Cup uh, or Champions Cup Rugby in Europe, now it's called, and you're trying to win the AFL Championship. It's a semi-final. The player isn't 100% fit. Not many are at the adult phase with a, a league system. You yeah. have those same monitoring tools. You know how bad it is, how good it is. You can evaluate the risk. And if it isn't head or heart, of course, head or heart, just sit out. If it's yep. muscular and there is a risk, you've done your your sessions, you know how the player's moving. Yeah, sometimes the the dial is turned down in the, the uh, pulling of players and modifying uh, with the adult player. And that's where there's yeah, some mate. great practitioners like Philip Morrow and Saracens, etc., who who manage that really well with the player's interest at heart and the performance of the team at heart and shared decision-making, I think would be the, the correct term for, for making a decision like that. Mm -hmm. And in the academy setting, you mentioned the coaches, there was an, a moment there where the everyone's involved in the same room, but just before training starts. And is it just the head coach? Is it the line coach? Is it one <laughs> coach in there or who's in the room? For that um, the, list, the, the whole yeah, the whole lot, and and in fairness to the Premier League academies, I think they're leading the way in interdisciplinary work. And one of the one of the instigators of that is the the league as a whole have have rules, E Triple P rules, and they really emphasise the right qualifications of people. They really emphasise the right contact with those people, and it really emphasises interdisciplinary work. So every academy has to have a performance plan in that is, is a vision, mission, pillars, as I say, values. Um, the club I was in really lived by that performance plan and the philosophy of the club. And one of the real good practices was the regular interdisciplinary meetings. So you'd meet as a daily, as an interdisciplinary team, and every team from 9 to 23 had more and more people as you got older. So if we look at under 18s, you have the sports psych, you have the nutritionist, you have operations, you have education, you have the coaches, you have the physios, you have the athletic development coaches. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, performance analysis, and they have to work together. It's led by the coach. That's the framework uh, within the club, and rightly so. Um, and yeah, every day, no, not those numbers. A smaller amount of that would be in the pre-session planning. But every week, There'd be a proper interdisciplinary meeting then with the players there'd be a player review every six weeks with those interdisciplinary team not everyone but a a, a, a representation of each area and then uh, there'd be a player parent review and then there'd be a, a squad review and then there'd be phase meetings as well so the under 12s 13s 14s would get together and discuss how they work together so these were timetabled in that it wasn't meeting overload they were, they were smartly planned in. But yeah, it, it led for some fascinating meetings. And say a long-term injury, we'd have a player meeting without the player first. We'd brainstorm, okay, what could we do? And one of the great initiatives from the, the sports psych team was, right, there's an injury. Let's take the player's mind off the injury. Let's learn a new skill, learn a new language, have a new uh, challenge. And we had players learn to play the guitar, uh, learn a different language. Uh, do an accountancy type course, uh, lots of different things. And that came from that interdisciplinary type work. And mm -hmm. we could have good conversations like most of the environments I worked with in the past. Oh, yeah, players injured, over to you, Des and, and Physio, you look after them. Coaches are busy, but because we were having those types of meetings, that sort of thing didn't happen. Um, that sort of thing evolved. So, okay, what are we doing in the four pillars? Okay, physical, we got our rehab, return to performance plan. Champion mentality, psychology, new skill, and develop in certain areas in terms of performance psychology. Um, effective team player, the technical tactical pillar. Okay, performance analysis and coach, we can do this amount of, of support for the player each week. Yeah, and education, okay, now that they're 
there's less game time, we can do a little bit more education. So the four pillars are discussed. Um, lifelong learner, education, uh, effective team player, technical, tactical, champion mentality, psychosocial, most efficient mover, physical. And the programme contains something from all those four pillars. And the interdisciplinary people plan together and everybody feels they need to contribute, especially to their pillar. And now the player has a holistic programme. And now there's a chance to review it, discuss it, evolve it. And it's how it should work. And uh, I think, yeah, Premier League Academies, great examples of interdisciplinary because of the the, the the volume of people, contact time, but they're an example to, to other sports, I think. Yeah. And did that, for that to work, like you said, that is quite advanced. Um, certainly not something I've experienced before um, where everyone like that is in, in that particular meeting. Um, it, how did that come about in terms of fitting that in the schedule? Obviously, you've got to value it and, and prioritise mm. it, but you know, I imagine it, the coaches, what you said, they're busy. They would have been doing something with that time slot. Uh, so what did, yeah. did you have to sacrifice something in the program to allow the coach to be available to be in that, in that meeting? Or? So. No, I think afternoons for coaches are, are not too bad. A lot of the yeah. trainings are in the morning, and, yeah, there's definitely time there. And the coaches in Arsenal fantastic. And they were, yeah, let's let's do this, enjoy this. Um, and the the managers, like the head of coach and academy manager, they they encouraged it. Then the logistics of it, the operations people, they could communicate it well with the various player management system apps we'd have. It'll be timetabled smartly. And our periodization was three weeks on and a deload week. And then in a deload week, there's less sessions, there's less contact, and that's the typical time for reviews, for player progress meetings, squad retain release meetings. And, yeah, they're planned smartly. Um, uh, but they're responsible things to do. Nobody could argue that it's the, 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 the wrong thing to do. It's given yeah. good quality feedback to the player. It's creating a good quality holistic plan. It's given good quality feedback to the parent. And as long as the the people's hours weren't overstretched. And I, I, I never saw that happen. Um, yeah, it worked. It was pretty good. And I don't want people to think, oh, that's only possible in Premier League. Where I'm now yeah, in, in Satanta, as well as education, we support teams and organisations. And one of our projects is a Gaelic Games club, amateur. Everyone is volunteers in it. And that club has a performance document. It's built over time with the coaching committee there. They have a vision, they have a mission, they have the four pillars, the values, principles of play, and they have interdisciplinary work. Not as often as a as an Arsenal Academy, but uh, often. And I'm on the performance committee who meet regularly, who review the different areas. And the, the interdisciplinary team there would be the facilities person. Uh, a friend who does the statistics performance analysis statistics on match day the physio that comes once a week for the game and the athletic development coach who's there regularly with the coach and maybe there's an assistant coach now you've got six people there maybe more and they need to understand the philosophy of the club the principles of pay they need to develop the timetable they need to do reviews of how it went for the first quarter and now the exact same in principle is happening in a volunteer community club as was happening in a, an elite academy like Arsenal. Yeah, I love it. Fantastic. Well, we've dived into some great information there and, and stories. And is there anything that um, we perhaps haven't touched on in terms of uh, an athlete development program that you'd like to share, Des, before we sort of wrap it up? I... I think we, we, we covered a lot there. No, I don't want yeah. to. I could ramble on for a long time on that. So I think I enjoyed I enjoyed what we covered. Yeah, it, it was yeah. a lot of things I'd, I'd like to share. We got covered. So, yeah, Fantastic. happy with that. Well, if anything pops up, feel, feel free to, to jump in. But um, last few questions. In your work life, is there anything that makes you angry? Anything, any pet peeves oh, in the industry? Yeah, or oh, Yeah, oh, of course there is. Sure, we all have yeah. that. And... <laughs> People who over-complexify, if that's even a word. Yeah, there's some very simple things in our industry in athletic development. And if, sadly, what really annoys me, if sometimes people want to sound intelligent and that they have the only answers, 
and they describe something that's very simple really complexly. And I'm going, yeah. no, no. Our role is to help people understand it. Our role is to to help everybody live and breathe it. Uh, and and when we over complexify, and things are complex, and I'm not shying away from complexity, but if they're over complexified for for no reason unnecessarily, yeah, that's that could be annoying. Uh, people yeah, forgetting totally. the past. Most answers to most questions are in our past, and there's a lot of things now that are are, are shared as the next new thing. And I'm going, oh, but sure, they did that in in East Germany back in the in the the the, the 40s, 30s, 50s. Uh, oh, that's not new, but yeah. it, it sold as new, but not too yeah. much. Yeah, there's only a, a yeah. couple. I lo love those; they resonate. What about what's your favorite way to spend a day off? Oh yeah, I'm 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 older now, so I like the countryside. That's why I. I moved back to, to the west of Ireland where I'm from and I love the the countryside there, the scenery, the sea. Uh, so I like just a, a half day in the countryside. I do a bit of paddle boarding. That's the only sport I can do these days. And getting away, paddle boarding, countryside. And of course, at the end of the day, watching a match, uh, any sort of sport. So so that's my, my sort of relaxing day. Yeah, very good. And we're sort of halfway through the year, 2023. Uh, what's on the horizon for you, Des? What are you most excited about for the rest of yeah, the year? Well, as a, as a supporter, I'm going to the Rugby World Cup. So I'll be spending a month in France now and really looking forward to that. Um, and maybe professionally, uh, this is something people might be interested in. Yeah, so Gaelic Games, Irish sports, we, we recently pulled together a, a sports science working group. And that's for the male and female Gaelic games, Komogi, ladies football, uh, hurling football. And we developed a sports science framework. And it's a vision for 2030 for Gaelic games. What provision should be in place in terms of sports science? And we, we covered most of the sports sciences performance analysis, skill acquisition, athletic development, psychology, nutrition, etc., cetera, um, and a guidance of what should be in place from all along the player pathway, from young to old. It it's, it's follows the Goblin model, actually, Australian influence in it. The centre is F3, the community, the club. That's the main part of it. It's unique Gaelic games that it's, it's amateur and it's all about participation. Yeah, there's an elite end to it and lots of people go watching the matches. But the beauty in Gaelic games, there's a club in every community in Ireland. It's the mm -hmm. hub of activity. It's the hub of community. So this is sports science helping that. More about participation than performance. I spent most of the time talking performance. So... We, we scribed what should be in place for athletic development at all the stages, F1, F2, F3, talent, elite, and what should be done, who should be doing it, and how it should be done. And the vision is to put those things in place. So I'm looking forward to those things coming alive and, yeah, and the journey on to 2023. And if people are interested, it's freely available on the, the GAA website. And I always like to share things as well as that on the GA website is the Be Ready to Play program. So that was when we were coming back from COVID and we were physically preparing people to be ready to play. The, the GA asked myself and a few others to come up with programs. So on that actually is a load of free programs, videos, uh, descriptions, showing the session in life, maybe six months of programs in mobility, stability, speed, strength, endurance for the youth, the youth player, the adult player and the advanced adult player. So it's it's there if you're in, and yeah, it's it's aimed towards Gaelic games, but they could be useful for many different sports. Oh, it's very right. similar to Australian rules football. So uh, there's some it is, football it is. Is in that yeah, could absolutely <laughs> value that. So we'll, we'll add, we'll find a link to get ready. Uh, be ready mm. to play link and we'll add it in the show notes for for the uh, listeners oh, to good. enjoy so that's a great Thanks. resource very good des well really appreciate your time i know it's early in the morning so appreciate you uh, getting up and, and you know diving straight into into this chat um, i thoroughly enjoyed it no doubt the listeners have taken plenty from it if you're tuned in halfway through you can watch this on our youtube channel and we'll release it 
on June 7th, so in a couple of weeks' time on our podcast. Our next live chat show will be with John Kylie. They'll be on June 8th at 4 p.m. Australian Standard Time. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, Des. Thanks for having me. Very kind of you, Tim.